the first of our uh, annual installments of uh, webinars through the AO Hand uh, North America Hand and Education Committee. Uh, to this evening's webinar is uh, based on or uh, about scaphoid fractures. Uh, I'm Kevin Malone. I'm your moderator and one of your speakers tonight, uh, and I'm uh, here from Cleveland, Ohio. And I am joined tonight by my other panelists, Dr. Blaine Bathis uh, from Metro Health Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio, and Dr. Sonu Jane, listed here from Ohio State, uh, but since uh, he accepted this invitation, has moved his practice to Cincinnati University of Cincinnati. So all three of us are uh, from the Buckeye State here. Uh, these are our disclosures uh, for the uh, this evening's session, and we don't think that there'll be any conflict of interest that will impact any of the material discussed, and these have all been thoroughly vetted. AO North America is an independent nonprofit surgical specialty society dedicated to improving the care of patients with musculoskeletal injuries. We do not endorse nor promote the use of any specific product or service of commercial entities. And equipment used in this course is for demonstration and teaching purposes with the intent to enhance the learning experience. The webinar, this webinar aims to strengthen existing diagnostic and treatment pathways while examining recent literature. The goal is to empower participants to formulate effective treatment plans for patients with scaphoid fractures. And our objectives are the following. Uh, at the end of this presentation, you will be able to order the appropriate imaging studies to accurately determine if a scaphoid fracture is present and if there is displacement that would benefit from surgical intervention, to discuss the risks and benefits of operative and non-operative management of non-displaced scaphoid fractures with the patients such that shared decision-making can occur in the development of a treatment plan. You'll be able to develop an appropriate surgical plan for acute fractures and fractures with non-union, and I'd also identify which patients and clinical scenarios would benefit from salvage procedures rather than attempted scaphoid repair or reconstruction. Here's our agenda for this evening. Dr. Bafis will talk to us about the evaluation of patients with suspected scaphoid fractures. I will then discuss management of the acute scaphoid fracture, followed by Dr. Jane discussing management of the scaphoid non-union. And we should have some time for question and answer and discussion before we adjourn. Pay attention to upcoming uh, opportunities through the AO North America. These are some uh, in-person events uh, throughout the country over the next several months uh, and upcoming webinars uh, in May on finger flaps, August on both bone forearm fractures, and then in December, distal radius malunion. And these webinars, as this one, are all free of charge. We do have a page, uh, AO North America trauma page on uh, YouTube, where all of these webinars are then archived. So you have the ability to go back and watch again uh, if you uh, feel that you've missed some of the material. So thank you very much for uh, tuning in tonight. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Bathis. So we're going to talk about the evaluation of the suspected scaphoid injury. These are my disclosures. The objectives, we're gonna explain the vascular anatomy of the scaphoid, list two benefits of early MRI for wrist pain, and list two risks of early MRI for wrist pain. Our case for, for uh, tonight is a 16-year-old female with a fallen and outstretched hand eight days ago uh, while playing high school soccer. She's tender in the snuff box. Uh, she doesn't have any ecchymosis or swelling and uh, just to make it more interesting, her parents are very uh, educated healthcare executives. These are her x-rays on presentation. Uh, and for those of you who can't see or if they don't project well, uh, we have a skeletally mature 16-year-old woman with uh, essentially a, a normal uh, wrist x-ray series. We're going to come back to this now. So starting with the epidemiology of scaphoid fractures, uh, they're uh, fairly common, 1.47 uh, fractures per 100,000 uh, person years, primarily in young males, about 66% of them, with a peak incidence at about uh, 10 to 19 years old. As you can see over here, uh, basketball, bicycling, and skateboarding are the primary uh, suspects for a uh, cause of injury, with a peak also at uh, 10 to 19 years old, as I mentioned. Uh, these demographics will likely change as women progress into the more aggressive sports. Excuse me about that. Uh, our anatomy, so the scaphoid. Scaphoid comes from the Greek skephon for boat. 
It spans the proximal and distal carpal rows. It stabilizes the proximal, uh, proximal row and translates motion from the radial carpal to mid carpal joints. Uh, so we're all uh, familiar with what we're talking about here, the scaphoid uh, on the radial side of the proximal row, uh, as demonstrated both in the x-rays and in the cartoon here. Uh, it's important to note that the scaphoid is about 80% articular cartilage. Uh, looking at this central picture here, uh, the, the cartilage is uh, depicted in pink. Uh, we have a, a distal pole, uh, which is going to be the uh, broad uh, distal pole. We have a tubercle on the radial side of the distal aspect. We have this uh, dorsal ridge, which is not uh, covered by cartilage and is perforated uh, in multiple uh, areas for the vasculature to enter. Uh, we have a waist, which would be just as you can imagine, straight across, and then the proximal pole, this uh, narrow point. The vasculature of the scaphoid is really uh, probably why we're talking about scaphoid fractures. It has a dominant retrograde flow uh, that supplies, uh, that, excuse me, that is supplied uh, distally through, primarily through the dorsal ridge off the dorsal carpal branch of the radial artery. There is also a smaller superficial uh, palmar branch of the radial artery that comes in through the distal pole. Uh, both in the cartoons here and in this arteriogram, you can see the smaller uh, distal blood flow and then the dorsal ridge uh, pri uh, primarily uh, uh, spreading blood throughout the uh, scaphoid itself. And then if the, you can imagine if the scaphoid is fractured, that the blood supply would largely be endosteal at that point. Uh, there's two morphologies to consider the scaphoid. We have on the left here, we have a type one where the waist and length are about equal. We have a type two where the length is greater than the waist. The type one is uh, uh, supplied by both a dorsal and, uh, excuse me, a distal and dorsal ridge blood supply, while the type two is really just dependent on the uh, dorsal ridge, making it a little more uh, at risk for uh, blood problems after a fracture. The mechanism of injury, as Netter's described here, it's a fall on an outstretched hand. But more than that, uh, it's really a fall on the thenar eminence with the hand pronated. You can imagine leaning back on falling off your skateboard or such, uh, landing right on the thumb uh, base and then fracturing the scaphoid. Our physical examination, obviously we're gonna start off with an inspection looking for uh, ecchymosis, swelling or deformity that might lead us to suspect one injury over another. Checking sensation, uh, you can run into issues with the median nerve if you land on it. You can have acute, acute carpal tunnel syndrome or just simply a contused nerve. Uh, we're going to palpate the snuff box as demonstrated on the left. So just distal to the radial styloid and at the base of the thumb. Then we're going to uh, extend the wrist and palpate just beyond the uh, volar rim of the radius and compress the uh, scaphoid tubercle and then a longitudinal compression of the scaphoid along the thumb. Once we've done that, we're going to get some imaging. First line imaging would be x-rays. We're going to start off with the PA, uh, and then we'll get a lateral, excuse me, a, an oblique view, uh, about 30 degrees pronated, uh, a lateral view, and then a, a, a PA in ulnar deviation trying to accentuate the scaphoid. This may also elicit any uh, intercarpal ligament disruptions. Uh, x-rays can be negative uh, or normal in the initial uh, 10 to 15 percent of 10 to 15 percent of patients with fractures. Here's just some clinical photos of those x-rays. Uh, again, a PA, oblique, and lateral, and then the scaphoid view, if negative. Uh, generally, we want to repeat these in 10 to 14 days, uh, looking for resorptive changes that may uh, make the fracture more evident. So once you've got your x-rays, uh, this is really why we're talking you're at a decision point with whether or not to do any additional imaging, pursue a CT scan or an MRI or uh, splinting. And so a CT scan can be useful if an MRI is not available or contraindicated. They're generally very easy to obtain. Uh, unfortunately, depending on what source you're looking at, uh, the uh, kappa value or the inter-observer reliability is uh, moderate uh, and that uh, scape a scaphoid CT is good at negative, excuse me, it has a good negative predictive value, meaning it can rule out fractures with a, a 0 0.99, but it's not so good at ruling them in. Uh, reformatting along the axis of the scaphoid may improve that negative predictive value. Uh, again, the numbers are uh, difficult because they're kind of all over depending on the source, which takes us to an MRI. So MRI is also very well researched. 
uh, to the point that the American College of Radiology has a position on it that if initial radiographs are normal, you have a, a decision uh, point where you can either do a cast or splint and repeat x-rays at 10 to 14 days or an early MRI. Uh, MRI sensitivity is excellent, approaching 100%, while specificity also approaches 100%, uh, 95 to 100%, uh, depending on your source, with a high inter-observer reliability. Uh, MRI is the advantage of an MRI. It can prevent unnecessary mobilization in up to three quarters of suspected fractures. An MRI costs the same uh, as casting a second visit or repeat MRI, excuse me, and repeat MRIs. And really, if you think about uh, an MRI without facility fees, you can get them quite cheap at some of the uh, private uh, scanners, uh, really making them competitive when you're thinking about your decision making. Uh, an MRI reduces lost productivity costs, meaning that they're cost effective. Uh, they can provide an alternative diagnosis, uh, such as associated carpal or radius fractures in up to 10% of patients, osseous contusions in 40% of patients, and soft tissue injuries in up to 43% of patients. Uh, in my search and preparation for this talk, I noticed that uh, Dr. Ring and his colleagues uh, published uh, just in December in, uh, in CORE an excellent uh, primary article and then a series of uh, interviews with the editor, and then a, uh, a debate upon, uh, between two surgeons. His article uh, was really talking about uh, that nonspecific or distracting misleading signal changes are common, uh, up to one-third of cases, and can lead to overtreatment or surgery and associated uh, costs, such as societal and economic. Um, so, you know, further uh, complicating things. The face-off, though, which was uh, between two surgeons, which I found pretty uh, informative and nicely summarized the literature is that actual fractures among suspected uh, fractures is low, 5 to 20 percent. In this setting, sensitive and specific tests can be misleading in low prevalence uh, findings. Uh, negative CT or MRI does reduce the risk of undertreatment below 1 to 2 percent. So you're not going to miss things if you've got a CT or MRI. Early MRI avoids overtreatment, uh, and that risks of an early MRI uh, include costs, limited resources, and workup of incidental findings. However, at the end, surveyed patients prefer knowing if they have a fracture. The fracture classification used for scaphoid fractures, and the AO uses the uh, traditional Herbert classification. You have an, a type A, which is based upon stability. So this is either a tubercle or a waist crack. So an incomplete fracture of the waist. Uh, type B is acute and unstable. Uh, and then that's based upon the location of the fracture, uh, whether or not it's the distal pole, waist, proximal pole, and then uh, a displaced waist or comminuted waist fracture. You have a type C, delayed union. Type D, established non-union, uh, either fibrous, or sclerotic. So our case, I placed her in a cast. Um, an MRI of the wrist was ordered. She returned back in about uh, eight days after the study was done uh, to review her MRI. Uh, the study was uh, significant that it showed no scaphoid fracture or carpal injury. She did have a dorsal wrist ganglion, uh, as noted in the upper left, and then a possible punctate tissue uh, tear of the TFCC. Fortunately, she had no wrist pain. The wrist was, excuse me, wrist ganglion was an incidental finding, and there was no uh, finding to support any concern of a TFCC uh, injury. Uh, after a discussion with the patient and the family, we opted to return her to sport uh, immediately without any problems. Uh, these are my references. So our take-home message is the vascular anatomy of the scaphoid relies on retrograde flow that can be disrupted by fracture. Uh, early MRI avoids overtreatment and is associated with, an in, with increased patient satisfaction. Early MRI ris, uh, risks subjecting the patient to unnecessary costs and further workup of incidental findings. Thank you. Todd, uh, thanks so much. <clears throat> we do have a question in your preparation. Certainly CT and MRI are some of the more commonly uh, regarded studies when evaluating for an occult scaphoid fracture. Uh, what about bone scan uh, and, and you know, of, of bone scan, CT, MRI, if you had to pick one, 
you know, which, what are you going to pick? For so I would specific diagnosis. That's a, a great question. Uh, bone scan. I, I'll be honest with you. I, let me turn on my video here. I had actually forgotten about bone scan because it's been so long since I thought about it as an option that I was, this study uh, kind of prepared me or refreshed that. It is an excellent study. Uh, they're not easily obtained. Uh, and so an MRI is definitely, I think, the way to go with the high sensitivity and specificity. Additionally, obtaining, you know, the information that it, maybe there's you know, a contusion or a SL injury or something that, that you'd want to know about. Perfect. Thanks so much. Okay, so we'll move on to the uh, management of the acute scaphoid fracture. So we know that uh, best results are associated with early diagnosis and treatment. Uh, and so here we have two similar appearing x-rays, but with two drastically different outcomes. The x-ray on the top left is a, a teenage uh, high school uh, soccer player injured while playing soccer, had wrist pain, came to the emergency room, uh, got x-rays which show a non-displaced fracture through the scaphoid waist. So this was pretty clear and other imaging studies were not necessary to make this uh, diagnosis. Uh, and so we were able to initiate early treatment and the family elected for non-operative treatment and he went on to very successful healing of his scaphoid fracture. But the different scenario is the one on the bottom left. And, and this is one that I think, unfortunately, we see a little bit more frequently. Uh, this is a, also a, a teenage uh, high school student who was involved in a motor vehicle accident, had primarily abdominal and visceral injuries, but did have wrist pain upon presentation, had an x-ray shown here, uh, not the normal complete series that uh, Dr. Bafis described, no, so no PA ulnar deviated view, but on the oblique view, it's fairly clear that there's a scaphoid waist fracture non-displaced. But unfortunately, the radiologist missed it. Uh, and even though the patient was hospitalized at a level one trauma center, there was no orthopedic consult obtained and no treatment rendered until she showed up many months later with an established non-union. So early diagnosis and initiation of treatment, whether it's operative or non-operative, is going to result in a much more likelihood, uh, higher likelihood of good outcomes. So there's no debate that acute scaphoid fractures are best uh, acute displaced scaphoid fractures are best treated surgically. And advanced imaging, as Todd indicated, may be necessary to determine if there truly is a fracture and if there is a fracture that is displaced. This study from 2018 showed that addition of a CT scan resulted in recognition of displacement in one third of the fractures that were initially thought to be non-displaced on x-ray. So if you're convinced there is a fracture but not sure if there is displacement, a CT scan may be more appropriate than an MRI in this situation. MRI has the highest sensitivity and specificity in the diagnosis of occult scaphoid fractures with normal films, but also can produce false positives such as bone contusion uh, and may reveal some of the other pathology that Dr. Baif has mentioned. So what the question always comes up is what qualifies as a displaced fracture? And many would suggest that if you see the fracture line on an X-ray, it is likely truly displaced and should be treated as such. Displacement and instability is correlated with prolonged time to union and increased risk of non-union. And signs of instability as listed here include fracture displacement greater than one millimeter, which may require CT to measure accurately, an increased scaphalunate angle, an increased lateral intrascaphoid angle, certainly fractures that are comminuted and those that are associated with perilunate instability patterns. A fracture of the scaphoid with a concomitant scaphalunate interosseous ligament is inherently more unstable than an otherwise non-displaced fracture. And the, this type of ligament injury may be appreciated on an MRI or if wrist arthroscopy were to be performed. Many fractures can be treated non-operatively if they truly are non-displaced. Those fractures oftentimes have an intact cartilage shell that can provide stability and contain fracture healing efforts. But if the cartilage shell is disrupted, then the synovial fluid from the joint can bathe the fracture and wash away any of the attempt at healing, uh, essentially increasing the chances that non-union will result. But many studies published res uh, show results of greater than 90% success with non-operative management of non-displaced scaphoid fractures. Historically, this was treated in a long-arm thumb spike cast for perhaps three weeks and then transitioned to a short-arm thumb spike cast 
But more recent studies have shown that short arm cast immobilization without incorporation of the thumb may have a higher union rate than incorporation of the thumb. Because of the vascularity issues that Dr. Baith has mentioned, these fractures do take a long time to heal and may require also prolonged immobilization. So it is estimated that in many cases, approximately 12 weeks of cast immobilization may be necessary for a non-displaced scaphoid waist fracture to heal. So because of all of this, there certainly is a role to consider operative management for these non-displaced fractures. In the right patient with early initiation of cast immobilization for non-displaced scaphoid fractures compared to surgical treatment, Tate and his uh, colleagues in 2016 found no difference in union rates, no difference in pinch or grip strength, increased wrist range of motion in the non-operative management group, decreased radiographic evidence of arthritis, decreased complication rate, decreased direct costs, but a slower return to work in athletics and an increased indirect cost, which essentially translates into time away from work and lost productivity. For those that are gonna be managed Operatively, the gold standard is compression screw stabilization. This can be approached through a volar approach, which may make it easier to image the scaphoid, but you do have to deal with the trapezium. The volar lip of the trapezium, if not addressed, will cause you to uh, aim your, or have to start your scaphoid screw more, much more volarly on the tubercle, which will then direct your screw more dorsally as it crosses the fracture, and you'll have a smaller uh, area of the proximal pole engaged and a higher likelihood of penetration. So excision of the scaphoid, or excuse me, the trapezium volar lip will give you a more direct route to the central axis of the scaphoid. Dorsal fixation may be better for proximal uh, fractures, but the fluoroscopy intraoperatively is more challenging because the guide wire in the scaphoid requires you to keep the wrist in deflection. So you may have to be looking at scaphoid views differently than what you would normally uh, uh, acquire. Percutaneous techniques have certainly been described, but many studies have shown that these to have a higher complication rate, uh, penetrate, or, uh, penetration of tendon, uh, superficial radial sensory nerve injuries, uh, inappropriate uh, starting point, uh, fractures, uh, and non-unions, higher incidence of all of these with the percutaneous techniques. If the fracture is displaced, the recommendations are to use the exposure needed to see the reduction. If it's a waist fracture, you have to be careful with a dorsal approach because you do not want to disrupt that important dorsal ridge vascular supply to the scaphoid uh, that might be necessary to visualize the scaphoid waist fracture. So in this situation, a volar approach may be more appropriate. If it's a non-displaced fracture, it is oftentimes easier to go from the smaller fragment to the bigger fragment, but ultimately you wanna do what you're most comfortable with. I have a case example here of a 21-year-old laborer who fell, had pain swelling in a snuff box, and had these initial four view x-rays, which do clearly show a non-displaced appearing fracture at the junction of the proximal pole and scaphoid waist. Initially, plans were to treat him non-operatively in a cast, but repeat x-rays one month later show increased lucency through the fracture site. Uh, and in, in physical examination, he had uh, still a fairly significant amount of pain uh, with palpation through the anatomic snuff box. So at this point, uh, the, the decision was to proceed with surgical stabilization, but because it was non-displaced, this could be done through a small incision. So for orientation, you're looking at the back of the wrist, the wrist is flexed, the, uh, the hand is at the top, uh, and the forearm is going to the elbow uh, below. And with the uh, retractors in there, you're looking directly down at the proximal pole of the scaphoid. Uh, our guide wire is placed here, again, uh, having to leave the, scape, the wrist flexed uh, because you don't want to bend the guide wire. But if you're not sure that you have the guide wire in the correct place, uh, you can then drive the guide wire all the way through and retrieve it at the thenar eminence. So the guide wire is now all the way in the scaphoid and now extend the wrist and get your normal views. And if you like the, where the position is, then you can then back the guide wire out so you can uh, seat your uh, cannulated screw over the guide wire. Uh, because of the four weeks that had passed and the lucency, we elected to bone graft this. So this is uh, bone graft plugs harvested from the distal radius, which are then inserted into the hole uh, created for the screw before screw insertion. And then the screw inserted, uh, which uh, in theory should displace this bone graft uh, into the uh, fracture site. And this patient went on to fix uh, successful healing of his scaphoid fracture and returned to all activities. 
It can be challenging to, to determine if the fracture is actually healing. The orientation and anatomy of the scaphoid uh, makes it challenging to see this on plain films. Serial radiographs are certainly important to determine if there is evidence of healing, but this is, should be combined with clinical examination uh, and looking for anatomic snuffbox tenderness. A CT scan has been proven to be more reliable than x-ray to determine the extent of healing, uh, written here in uh, 2020 out of the European Journal of Radiology. Uh, and uh, Gus and his colleagues in 2018 suggested that if 50% healing demonstrated on a CT scan of a scaphoid uh, should then be stable enough to allow that patient to return to athletic activities. This is our second case example, a 23-year-old professional football player injured in a game, landed on his wrist. Uh, initial x-rays, uh, not necessarily all that remarkable, but as these professional athletes do uh, get a lot of other imaging studies, MRI and CT scan both clearly show evidence of a, a acute non-displaced scaphoid fracture. Uh, and so he was treated uh, with the same small, minimally uh, invasive uh, dorsal incision uh, and insertion of a screw. Uh, here he is with x-rays one month later and CT scans one month later showing uh, good healing across the fracture and he was cleared to return uh, to uh, practice and games. So topics for further discussion with acute scaphoid fractures, but perhaps more appropriate for the non-union discussion with Dr. Jane, uh, are alternative constructs. Uh, you'll see articles now looking at dual compression screws and, uh, instead of one, so one single screw. The use of uh, locking plates for the scaphoids are becoming a little bit more popular, again, for uh, non-unions. Uh, and then adjunctive treatments such as the use of bone stimulators. Uh, and perhaps we'll learn more about that with Dr. Jane's presentation to follow. So in summary, early diagnosis and initiation of treatment are key to good outcomes with scaphoid fractures. CT scans may be necessary to determine if displacement is present. Uh, Non-operative management of truly non-displaced fractures have an excellent union rate, but this can take a long time to heal in a cast. Surgery for these fractures is associated with higher direct costs, lower, in, lower indirect costs, sorry, that should be indirect, and a potential for earlier return to work in sports. And all displaced and unstable fractures are indicated for surgery. The gold standard is a headless cannulated compression screw, and a surgical approach is dependent on fracture pattern and a surgeon preference. Thank you very much. Any questions to, to go over here, guys? Uh, uh, it does look, here we have a question about, uh, do you remove hardware prior to return to play? Uh, no, uh, I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that that uh, returning, uh, removing a heart or a screw uh, is uh, necessary before returning to play. Uh, we have a lot of questions about that, about those who are going to go into military uh, service as well, uh, with a history of a prior scaphoid fracture. Uh, and I think removal of a screw in this situation is likely an unnecessary risk uh, and potentially fraught with complications. Uh, and then the type of screw. There's many different screws in the market. You got to use one that you're comfortable with. They all have subtle differences. Uh, you know, at my hospital, we're obligated to use certain certain companies based on contract. Uh, I don't know that there's evidence that one screw is any particularly better than any other. Sonu, Todd, do you have any other thoughts about that? No, I agree exactly with what you said. I, I would just caution on that if you've got a common unit scaphoid fracture, using one with continuous compression can create problems. Uh, you know, because you're going to compress right through all that comminution. I've created some deformities and had some trouble with that in, in, in my own cases. Okay, and then there's one more question before we turn it over to Sona. The, uh, the case that I presented that had some resorption that I bone grafted, uh, I don't know that there's any uh, clinical evidence here to say, you know, you need so much or, or not enough. You know, it was just be because we had waited and watched this and the fracture line seemed to be getting bigger. Uh, we, we thought about bone grafting it. I think he probably would have healed without it, uh, just with some good solid uh, compression. If you guys have any different thoughts about that. I've always thought that even the drilling, you know, as as you taught me, Dr. Malone, even the drilling stimulates little healing in these situations. For sure. Thank you. All right, Sonu, all yours. Oh, thanks, Kevin. Let's see.
Okay. Let's see. Okay. Well, th thanks, uh, Kevin, you for, uh, for display settings and switch. Oh, it's and still yeah. Sitting. There you go. I got it. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> you didn't want to memorize that. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Thank well, you. thanks. Um, so we're going to talk about the dreaded scapegoat fracture non-union here. So we're going to kind of allude to points made earlier by Dr. Bates and Dr. Malone. So as you know, the scaphoid is prone to non-union. Um, obviously, there's poor blood supply that was mentioned. The fractures are intraarticular by definition. There's a constant load to it. And oftentimes, some of these are minimally symptomatic, such that you don't find out that you have fracture till later on. So um, they vary in presentation by location, uh, vascularity, and displacement. And you can see the different kinds of non-unions listed here. Um, so, you know, what, what does the evidence show? So the evidence shows that there's really no significant difference in union rates if you use vascularized bone graft or non-vascularized bone grafts, you know, whether you're taking the uh, cancellous bone from uh, or, or coral cancellous bone from the distal radius or from the iliac crest, or whether or not you're using screws or, or K-wires or, or no fixation, and, and obviously that would be in a non-displaced uh, scenario. So, what about the structural autograph? So, you know, we're going to sort of challenge some of the norms here a little bit in today's talks and uh, kind of give, uh, you know, alternative options for a lot of things. And so, you know, typically we've treated these with cortical cancellous grafts for structural support. But, uh, you know, Mark Cohen showed that you can actually have great results with uh, cancellous only grafts uh, and you can have good union rate with those. And 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 that's something to be considered. So, you know, an approach for a scape wood waste non-union, um, particularly when you have humpback deformity, you can, you know, use that method where you're using cancellous autograph. But, you know, do what's comfortable for you. If you want to use cortical cancellous autograph, that's perfectly fine to get that structural support. Um, this is something you're going to find out as, as you, you know, do these cases and see what works best in your hands. Um, if you have uh, humpback plus an AVN or previous surgery or, Bone grafting, I think in those cases, I tend to go to the uh, vascular medial femoral condyle autograft in, the, in those scenarios. Um, and if you have an alignment where the, the shell is not really disrupted and you have a stable non-union, um, then you can actually do what Dr. Mullen talked about. You can actually do the same technique and do a percutaneous uh, uh, bone grafting technique where you can, and I'll, we'll, we'll show you that. Um, so if you have a proximal pole, no AVN, you can still do that perk or mini open with cancellous bone grafting, and if you do have AVN, you want to maybe consider a vascularized bone graft, whether it's pedicled or or, or a, a free uh, graft. So um, we're going to go over a series of cases here. Um, first one here is a 27-year-old female uh, non-smoker, uh, injured her wrist uh, about a year prior to presentation, um, has pain, stiffness, and the initial x-rays were negative and or, or red is negative. That's the common, common theme uh, you've been hearing tonight. Um, so, as you can see here, um, these are the x-rays, and courtesy, this uh, case is courtesy of one of my, one of my partners, uh, Dr. Juan. Um, and so, you have this established non-union here, and you see the sclerosis and, and cystic change, and uh, you can see the, the uh, scapegoat alignment being maintained, and there's no real DZ deformity. So, what, what are the options here? You can, you know, you heard all the different uh, options earlier. It, it definitely applies here as well for um, the non-unions. Can you just put a screw across this alone? Should I go vulvar or dorsal? Should I open this up or go percutaneously? Should I put a vascularized or non-vascularized bone graft? You know, cancellous or cortical cancellous graft. I mean, you have a lot of choices here. Um, so um, in this case, we're we're talking about the percutaneous uh, approach here, and what we're trying to do is cause less disruption for the blood supply. Um, less dissection. You don't have to, especially when volarly, you're not having to take down the radius, give a cavity, a ligament, polar capsule, and you're not disrupting the cartilage shell. Um, and so you can see here this in this technique, um, you can go volarly, place your guy wire similar to what uh, you know Dr. Malone talked about earlier, and then you can see that going in. And then what you're going to do is you're going to drill through that non-union. Okay, all the same stuff as you do for an acute scapegoat fracture, and then you advance the wire. But in this case, you're going to take a small micro curette and you're going to curettage the, the non-union uh, aggressively. So you're going to, you know, get that all cleaned out. And then you can do your mini um, dorsal incision to, uh, over Lister's tubercle and get your bone graft to the distal radius. And then you're going to pack the bone graft to the uh, drill hole and then place the screw. So I'm going to play this video here so you can 
see um, this happening here. That's just getting our bone graft uh, from the uh, Lister's cubicle using just a little uh, trefine just to get that uh, plug out. Um, and then uh, that will be used later to uh, be packed into the um, small mini open um, incision uh, on the volar aspect. So you can see that being placed into the um, previously drilled um, uh, pathway, and then you can use your back of your K-wire to kind of pack it in. And then, um, you know, once you have your guide wire back in, then you can um, go ahead and uh, then place your, your screw, as you'll see shortly. So obviously measure your, your screw length, and then that's being placed. There, and that's pretty much it. So, um, so as you can see, post op, that's what that looks like. This is a case of mine. Um, Twenty one year old male injured his right wrist three years prior to being seen. Treated non off the cast for a skateboard fracture. He developed a non union. He's a non smoker, and you can see there's a lot of uh, cystic changes and some sclerosis. And and uh, when we got a CT scan, you can see quite a bit of humback deformity and, and loss of. A lot of the structure uh, of the uh, scaphoid. Um, in this case, I actually did a medial femoral condyle uh, graft here for getting um, vascularity as well as structural support. Um, you could have probably uh, done a free uh, graft without uh, or a non vascularized graft here. I don't think you had to do it, but this is a decision we made just based on the, um, the length of his non union uh, development and also given the defect he had. But in any case, uh, you know, this was done. Uh, I usually, when I do this uh, procedure, I do offload the lunate by placing a um, radial lunate pin to um, correct um, the uh, extension of the lunate and to offload that uh, tension at the scaphoid ligament. So I keep that in for about six weeks. Um, but you can see here, one year later, he healed quite well, and then even two years later, he's maintaining that. So actually, doing really well from this, and clinically. He um, had pretty good motion with really excellent wrist extension flexion, which um, is, you know, we don't typically see that with non union uh, patients. Uh, full protosupination, full fist. I mean, his grip and pin strength were, were, you know, similar, if not better, than his contralateral side. He was back at rock climbing and he could actually do push ups where he had a little bit of discomfort, but no pain. And so I think that's a, that's a win. Um, so what, what's the data say? Well, I mean, you know, this meta-analysis that looked at, uh, you know, 12 articles and up to, you know, 262 patients showed had a pretty good union rate, about 93%, uh, and that took about almost uh, four months to, to really happen, uh, which is understandable given it's a non-union. But, you know, in spite of, in spite of those, uh, you know, great results, there is a, a complication rate associated with it, including the non-union, but these are, a lot of these were pretty, pretty minor, uh, no loss of, of the actual uh, Pre graft. So, uh, third case here is a courtesy of Dr. Malone here. He's a 13 year old uh, acute scaphoid fracture presented to the orthopedic surgeon within two weeks of injury. He was treated with a cast. We're going to go down this timeline here no pain, transition into a splint. Four months later, no pain, advised return to activities, um, was supposed to follow up as needed. Um, and then you can see here that he returned. Um, about a year later, and he had uh, pain in, in his wrist, and you can see that, uh, you know, um, non-union developing here. He got some vitamin D levels taken, showed he had a low vitamin D, and so that was started. He got a CT scan MRI, which you can see here. Um, and then at 14 months from the injury, he uh, had a uh, scaphoid uh, fixation with a non-vascularized cortical cancellous bone graft from his radius, as you can see. Um, so two months later from that, you know, his cast has continued, still on vitamin D, start a bone stimulator, don't see too much healing there yet. Okay, four months later, um, he's non-tender, but, um, and his vitamin D is, is, is fine. Five months later, persistent wrist pain, got a CT scan, and uh, you can still see that non-union so then he was referred uh, to uh, Dr. Malone here um, sometime later and at 28 months, so about two and a half years almost from his original injury and uh, still, you know, continue the vitamin D and calcium, but you can see 
uh, it's a pretty uh, well established non union here. And then, so we underwent a revision of this uh, with cortical cancellous disgrace graft with uh, scapal cavity pinning um, and a larger diameter screw. And, you know, um, some months after that, Castro moved uh, and then he was out of work, uh, sorry, out of uh, Splint for his uh, school work to get that going. And then um, he's developed some months later some progressive pain. Again, looks like um, the fracture was still not healing. So, and it went a uh, third operation for this, and this is where, you know, the uh, uh, plate was used. So he, uh, given the previous surgeries, uh, a uh, spoiler scaphoid plate uh, was placed here um, to help stabilize this, which is a very reasonable option, something to consider um, in your armamentarium when taking care of these, and um, also had a bone stimulator. And then about a couple months after this, still in this cast, this is the last x-ray we uh, have. But uh, the, so far, no hardware failure, and uh, it's uh, uh, keeping everything out to positional length. Um, so we'll see how he does with that. So what what's the data on scaphoid plating? Well, um, so study out of um, the Bowdoin Joint Journal looked at 49 patients uh, with a pretty good follow up of over three years, and it showed, you know, 96% union rate with with CT scan confirmation, and actually. Also showed great, uh, you know, improvement in range of motion and grip str uh, strength from the pre-op, which is statistically significant. And then when you are comparing um, uh, scaphoid uh, fixation using uh, screw versus the volar plate, uh, you know, this study looked at this um, and showed that the plate actually had improved a scaphoid angle as well as an intra-scaphoid angle, whereas the screw only had improved a scaphoid angle, which made sense because you have that internal, you know, uh, splint of, of the of the uh, of the plate really preventing the the scaphoid from collapsing on itself, which I think the screw probably doesn't do as good of a job, and that's what Dr. Bafus referred to earlier with some of these uh, compression screws that you may lose some of that angle. But um, the other thing to note was that the plate actually consolidation um, much sooner than the, than the screw in these cases. Again, this is a non-randomized study, so you can. Uh, you know, uh, read into that uh, in, in whichever way you want, but uh, it does show a pretty significant difference. Um, so, what's the bad on the skateboard plane? Well, you know, this other study at the journal hand surgery showed uh, out of 15 patients that, you know, you had a lot of complications where you really had decreased range of motion grip strength to the contralateral side. As you can see, you had four patients out of the 15 with hardware failure, a screw, for, uh, sorry, plate fracture and screws uh, backing out. Six patients with radial styloid impingement with the plate, and five of these patients, so one third requiring hardware removal, um, and the union rate was similar to other fixations, so it just had a higher complication. So, you know, again, the, the jury's out on this. Um, so, the other technique that we're going to talk about is a double screw fixation, which I think some people are starting to do more and more of. Um, and this study uh, showed that um, you actually got pretty good uh, union at about two and a half months. And in fact, out of these 21 patients, 14 of them actually healed at eight weeks now without hardware failure and also had similar improved range of motion and grip strength. And, and the authors here felt it was an effective treatment uh, and, and scaphoid non-union surgery. Um, so what are the biomechanics? What, what uh, does that show? Well, um, the study at journal hand surgery showed out of 28 cadaveric scaphoids, if you place two screws parallel in the chromal plane versus in the uh, sagittal plane, it actually showed no difference. So the thought is you can just place these screws wherever you want to place. There's no rhyme or reason. So I think you can feel comfortable doing that if you're going to go for double screw fixation. Um, and then um, if you're going to look at single versus uh, dual headless compression screws, this uh, study out of uh, the hand journal showed that even though the double screw um, uh, construct maintained rotational stability, there was no significant difference in load to failure. So um, that was found at least in the cadaveric model here. So um, when we go to the bone stimulator here, so this is hard because there's not much data in terms of scaphoid. Um, so um, what we did find is that uh, this uh, you know, article out, out of PRS Go by, by Kevin Chung showed that, um, you know, uh, bone stimulators are fairly underutilized um, in, in the population. Um, 
and use less than 2% of the time in both operative and non-operative patients based on this claims database search that they did. Um, and then when you're trying to look at uh, effectiveness here, um, a lot of the data is on long bones, but uh, you know the applicability of that to scaphoids is still you know, hard to determine because this study, even though it looked at 62 patients prospectively for upper and lower extremity fractures, and they were followed for six months, of the five scaphoids they had that were non-unions, none had healed with the bone stimulator. So, you know, again, I don't think this should, uh, you know, push you one way or the other. It's just that we don't have clear data for scaphoids for using, you know, uh, bone stimulators. So, but I think a lot of us still use it because I think, um, you know, what we found with other bones and also with we really want to throw everything we can to get the scaphoid to heal because the consequences of a non healed scaphoid are, 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 are not good. So this is a nice little summary of uh, surgical techniques for scaphoid non-union. I won't go over all the details, but um, this is out of the journal American Academy of Peak Surgeons here, um, but it really kind of re summarizes the different uh, options you have and, and the pros and the cons. So uh, it did, um, you know, cover most of what we talked about. We did not cover staples. That's another uh, new and upcoming way to sort of uh, fix uh, scaphoids as well, but uh, there's a cost to it as well. And uh, again, you have to worry about uh, the implant uh, um, impingement that could happen with that. And uh, so summarizing uh, non-union treatment. So in the waste stable non-union, you can consider proteins bone grafting if you want to. Um, for humpback, you can do an ORF with cancellous hysteresis graft or coral cancellous graft. Uh, with AVN and humpback deformity, you consider a vascularized, uh, you know, MFC in, in that case. Um, for proxal poles, uh, if there's no AVN, you can do an ORF with a cancellous hysteresis bone graft. But if there's AVN, you can consider, um, you know, a pedicled or even a medial femoral, femoral trochlea. Uh, graph and again we're not going to detail uh, about that on on this uh, talk and that is it thanks thanks Sonu so a couple of questions here from the audience at what time point do you think a fracture becomes a non-union as opposed to you know that when is a non-union a non-union as opposed to just still an acute fracture you would treat it differently I was just about four to six months in my yeah, I think I think that's about what I was gonna say too. Um and then you know we we didn't really get into it for time constraints, but you know, the salvage procedure, you know, if you have a you've you've done all these things and you still have this unhealed scaphoid, which I might be looking at with that uh scaphoid plate, you know. What what are your th your thoughts, Todd and Sonu, on on how to how to manage the patient? What do you do then? Uh simple excision of the distal scaphoid, or are you gonna do some other salvage procedure? Assuming that we haven't headed into a snack wrist and it's just a scaphoid, uh, yeah, I really got to take the patient into consideration. What are their goals? How many more procedures are they willing to do? Um, I have done distal scaphoid excision and just seen how it went. I mean, your other option would be, I mean, just to take it out and head to a four corner, depending on their age. I think those are all, you know, you, you can't make just a rope decision. It's got to be a lot of other factors, uh, you know, what the rest of the wrist looks like what their age, their physical demands are. Uh, are they a smoker? If they're a smoker, yeah. you, you know, you, you might not be uh, willing to be, be willing to consider a mid carpal fusion and might sway someone more towards a proximal rope herpectomy, particularly if they're a little bit older. Right. Uh, and then another question here is uh, how long do you immobilize after your non-unions? And at what point are you getting a CT to evaluate for healing? Do you routinely get CT, Sonu, to evaluate for healing? For non-unions, I do. For um, acute scaphoids, I don't necessarily. Yeah. And, and how long are you immobilizing your non-unions? As opposed three, to? <laughs> three, three months, three yeah. to four months. I mean, depending upon, you know, the age, but at least three months, then I'll kind of go from there, depending upon what the x-rays and I'll look at. And then I'll start thinking about getting a CT. It may vary. If I see some if I see some, you know, um, initial healing and if it's progressing, I may hold off on the CT a little bit. But if I don't see much progress, I may get it just to sort of figure out what's going on here. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, for me, my non-unions are definitely in a cast for at least six weeks. And then, you know, perhaps I'll put them in a, a rigid removable brace. They can, they can take off to shower, take off the you know, keyboard or handwrite. But 
nothing else until probably at least three months. And there's good evidence, radiographic evidence of healing before I let them start doing any more with that gripping, twisting. I agree. I don't hesitate to get CT scans if, uh, to assess for the healing, even in the in just a, a primary or apto, depending on how fast we're trying to get the patient back to you know work or whatever. It can be very helpful, and they they are very they can be pretty cheap out there. A CT scan doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Great. Um, another participant asked, "When would you consider complete removal of the scaphoid non-union pieces?" I, I I'm thinking that's just the excision of the distal scaphoid as we sort of mentioned it's you know you get worried about destabilizing the midcarpal joint with a distal scaphoid excision through the you know taking the not fracture out in the distal pole uh you could you might get lucky maybe they get stiff uh but i think you've got to make, make sure that patient is aware that this may not be their last surgical procedure on their wrist mm -hmm. all right any other uh Comments, thoughts, closing, closing ideas here, Todd Sono. No, when I when you showed that case with the IV line right next to this scaphoid fracture, I cringed <laughs> because you know we're all uh, seeing that. And you know anybody in the audience, I just you know you gotta stress getting good X-rays are so important. Very good. Well, Todd uh, Sono, thanks so much for uh, your participation tonight, and to the uh, the crew here that's still on. We had a, a, at one point I think 120. Uh, some uh, participants here. So thank you for tuning in from wherever you are. Uh, I hope you have a good rest of the evening, rest of the week, and uh, be sure to uh, keep an eye out for upcoming AO uh, webinars and uh, in-person events. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.